Okay, we're back, and this will probably be um, the last video um, describing this process of long-term potentiation. We are almost finished. We're almost through the whole story here in terms of talking about how synapses strengthen. Um, so we've seen, um, really, we've sort of seen all the pieces to the puzzle here in terms of um, understanding how synapses strengthen um, involving uh, two receptors, NMDA and AMPA. NMDA receptors are important because they allow calcium to enter into the cell under appropriate conditions, remember, um, the conditions that are required for LTP, long-term potentiation, um, being that there's the release of glutamate from the presynaptic neuron, and not only that, but also the postsynaptic neuron has to already be stimulated, has to be, have generated an action potential recently. That's important because it, the stimulation of the postsynaptic neuron um, ejects that magnesium from the NMDA receptor that was blocking this channel. So that um, when a molecule of glutamate binds with the NMDA receptor now, um, the channel is not blocked. All that calcium can come rushing inside. That will trigger um, some molecular um, reactions, chemical reactions that will, we're going to talk a little bit more about here, that will trigger the movement of these AMPA receptors into the synapse. And all of these AMPA receptors control um, sodium channels. And so basically what this is doing is providing many more doorways for sodium to come rushing into the cell. And that's important because sodium is a positively charged um, ion. right? And so it gives more doorways through which all of that positive stuff can come flooding in and allows much more sodium to come flooding into the cell in response to stimulation from the presynaptic neuron. And so um, it allows for much easier stimulation of the postsynaptic neuron. And that contributes to the strengthening of um, the synapse, and that's long-term potentiation. So as I've said, we've, we've um, talked about really sort of all of the steps involving long-term potentiation. Um, one thing we haven't really necessarily talked about yet is just go back to that slide here for a second. Um, what is actually causing, at a molecular level, what's causing this part, this process, this movement of AMPA receptors from the dendritic shaft here to the synapse. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about here in this video. Um, and um, foreshadowing what's to come, and we've mentioned this before, what's going to be crucial in this process is um, that uh, molecule um, or protein, as you would call it, it's a protein, um, PKM zeta, which is um, going to be crucially important for this process of long-term potentiation as well, sort of the, the last piece of the puzzle that we haven't talked about yet. So um, before we get to that, though, let's first mention one thing. Um, and this is a fairly recent discovery. Um, and that is that for a long time, people really thought that long-term potentiation really was just a single process, um, which is really everything that we've described up to this point involving the role of the um, NMDA receptors and the AMPA receptors and the um, entry of calcium into the cell and the movement of AMPA receptors into the um, synapse. Um, for a long time, that was really all that people thought there was to long-term potentiation. And in several, in sort of recent years, it's been discovered that really that's not the whole story. Um, that there's really sort of two different types of long-term potentiation, or at least you can think of it as two different stages of long-term potentiation. So there's early long-term potentiation, which is really everything that we've talked about so far. Um, depolarization of the, the postsynaptic cell, 
release of glutamate by the presynaptic cell, um, activation of the NMDA receptors, which allows calcium to enter the cell, which activates enzymes, and which cause the AMPA receptors to move into uh, the synapse, into the, the postsynaptic membrane. Um, that's everything that we've talked about so far. So everything that we've talked about so far in the previous videos is all describing um, this early long-term potentiation. And what's interesting about early long-term potentiation is that this really only lasts a couple hours. Um, so all of these things that we talked about contribute to the strengthening of a synapse, but the strengthening of that synapse really only lasts a couple of hours. Um, so clearly, if we want to understand um, how long-term memories are formed, memories that um, last much longer than a few hours and that may in fact be potentially infinite, um, some of our most enduring memories that may last an entire lifetime, um, clearly we can't be talking about, or we must talk about, have to talk about something um, involving changes in synapses that last for more than just a couple hours. And so that's what we're going to talk about here, which is um, a sort of a, I wouldn't call it a different type of long-term potentiation, but it's at least a sort of a second stage of long-term potentiation, and it's called long-lasting long-term potentiation, or we'll abbreviate it LLTP. So early long-term potentiation could be abbreviated as ELTP. Long-lasting long-term potentiation we'll abbreviate as LLTP. And so this is long-term potentiation that lasts for more than just a few hours. And so what's going to be crucial for this that wasn't necessary for ELTP is protein synthesis, the creation of some protein. That wasn't necessary. That wasn't a necessary part of ELTP, early long-term potentiation, but it will be a necessary component to LLTP. And so what is that protein that needs to be synthesized or needs to be created um, to produce LLTP? It is this thing that we've already mentioned um, sort of at the beginning of the semester and which um, you read a little bit about a couple weeks ago now um, uh, involving recent discoveries about how scientists and researchers may be able to um, delete memories has to do with this protein called PKM Zeta. This is the protein that needs to be synthesized or needs to be created to produce long-term potentiation that lasts for more than just a couple of hours. Um, so that produces long-term, long-lasting, long-term potentiation. Um, so um, just to sort of point out, um, there uh, are lots of sort of steps involved in this process. Um, each one's not really incredibly complicated, but there's just a lot of them. Um, but we're going to try to do our best to walk through each of these um, fairly slowly. Um, and um, we'll sort of take a look at all the steps of what's going into LLTP. Um, in fact, let me just sort of go, this is sort of just describing in words um, the process of LLTP, but I think it helps more so to look at a picture of what we're going to look at, and I'll just sort of describe all of this stuff as we work our way through the picture. Um, so let's go to that. Okay, so here is a picture of um, really sort of three different phases um, looking at a dendritic shaft, okay? so. Let me just draw a line here between all of these. These are all of the same dendritic shaft, but we're looking at how changes are happening here inside of this cell over the course of time, right? So these arrows here are showing um, time as it's progressing. Okay, so let's start um, over here. Let's call this number one. 
So at first, the cell is at rest, right? Um, and we see that this cell has an AMPA receptor um, in its postsynaptic membrane. Um, here's an NMDA receptor. We know what they do. Um, the cell is at rest. And so one of the things that's important to note um, as we start this discussion of LLTP, here is, um, imagine, the nucleus of this cell. And we've said the nucleus contains all the genetic information for a cell, and it um, is involved in sort of um, protein synthesis and sending um, you know, signals and things out to different parts of the cell to aid in the synthesis of new proteins. And so one of the things that's interesting is that um, the gene um, that's responsible for the production of PKM zeta is really always active. Um, if we just go back to this slide for a second. The gene that's responsible for this, for the synthesis of PKM zeta, it's constantly active. And so what that means, it's constantly transcribing the DNA of the gene into what's called messenger RNA, um, which is being transported, this messenger RNA, or sometimes called mRNA, um, it's being transported to the vicinity of the dendritic spines. So the nucleus is sending mRNA, messenger RNA, uh, that's for the creation of PKM zeta up to the dendritic shaft. So it's, it's like always sending this, um, this messenger RNA uh, to enable the creation of PKM zeta. So the nucleus is always sending this information up here because the gene that's responsible for creating PKM zeta is always active. So this sort of is always happening. Messenger RNA for PKM zeta is always being sent up into the area of the dendritic shaft. However, so you would think that with that being the case that PKM zeta is always being created in the dendritic shaft, but that's not the case. There is um, an enzyme called PIN1 that actively inhibits, that's what this is showing here, actively inhibits the creation of PKM zeta. So that's what we're at here. The enzyme called PIN1 inhibits this translation of PKM zeta mRNA into PKM zeta. So basically all that means is that this, this enzyme here is preventing this messenger RNA um, from being synthesized or turned into PKM zeta protein. So even though this is always going on, and, and mRNA for PKM zeta is always being sent up to the dendritic shaft, new molecules of PKM zeta are not being created because of this enzyme PIN1, which is essentially preventing it, it's blocking it. Okay. So that's when the cell is at rest. Now let's assume that the conditions have been met for long-term potentiation. And so again, what are those conditions? Um, the membrane is depolarized. Whoops, it's not at all a straight line. The membrane is depolarized. The postsynaptic membrane has been depolarized, which means that the neuron, this neuron, has generated an action potential. Um, so that allows um, or causes that roadblock of magnesium to get ejected from the cell. Um, and so if glutamate binds with this NMDA receptor, well then all of this calcium, all these calcium ions can come flooding inside of the cell. Okay, so we've already said that. We've said that um, this is what happens. Um, when the NMDA receptor uh, opens up its calcium channel, all this calcium can come flooding inside the cell. We haven't talked about what happens when that calcium comes flooding inside the cell, so that's what we're gonna focus on here. What happens when all that calcium comes inside the cell is that it, it, it sort of binds with other enzymes that are inside the cell. In particular, there's one that's um, called CAMK2. And this is um, when it activates this enzyme, CAMK2 actually inhibits PIN1. So it sort of shuts this PIN1 enzyme down. 